I need to know how Skynet gets built. Who's responsible? The year was 1992. I was 12, and I know, I just dated myself. Thing is, many of us grew with a very weird concept of what artificial intelligence is. Robots will take over the world, and you get the picture. It's no surprise that when we get this, the immediate human reaction of most people is to creep out. Science fiction has been so ingrained into our society that many times we forget that this is science fiction. It's not real. Now, what is real is AI, but it's actually a completely different thing to what we see in the movies. It's not a robot that'll come and serve you a drink, even if we wish it were. Instead, it's one of the most important layers that enables your phone to be called smart, but which even I wasn't able to tell until I decided to do the following test. These are two photos taken with a 12 megapixel camera in full auto. One is my full frame Sony a7S III that costs $4,000, and the other is my Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3, which costs four times less money and has a camera sensor that's a fraction of the size of the camera. Can you tell the difference? Obviously, a photographer will, but the average untrained eye most likely won't, and there's a high possibility you'll find the Galaxy to take a more visually appealing photo as it manages to handle dynamic range better than the camera if you notice the sky. Now, have a look at this other 16 megapixel photo. It was taken with a six-year-old Galaxy Note 4. So think of it. How is it that even with less megapixels, this year's phone has far better results than a phone from years ago? Sure, you could argue sensor size and micron size, but it turns out that it only accounts for half the story. I mean, how many times have you seen phones with great hardware that don't take photos this good? The other half of the story is actually artificial intelligence, and I dug into such a deep rabbit hole trying to clear my own misconceptions that we decided to partner with Qualcomm on helping me understand how AI makes my phone better. I mean, they are the experts in how this all works. I'm Jaime Rivera with Pocket Now, and let's dive in. This is Ziad Asghar, one of the masterminds behind Qualcomm Snapdragon chips. You've probably seen him in many of his presentations whenever we get a new chip announced and where this roadmap is going. And obviously, the most important question for the purpose of this video is to just clarify what the term AI means for the rest of us humans. Are you really sure, by the way, they haven't taken over? I'm just kidding. So essentially, artificial intelligence is this umbrella term that we have coined that basically talks about machines that have intelligence as in being able to sense what's happening around them, to be able to reason based on that, and then to even take some actions. There are subsets of artificial intelligence, the first one being what we call machine learning. So think of machine learning as, you know, when you typically program something, you go ahead and say and use certain if-else statements to tell the machine what to do, which means, well, if you see a car, and if you're an autonomous car, you stop. Very high level, right? But what machine learning means is that now you don't have to explicitly train the machine to do that, but you can actually, or have to program it, but you can actually give it data that it's able to learn based on that. That's deep learning, where we use uh, neural networks to be able to do some processing that allows machine to take certain actions. So my point is, we're really far from that high-level generalized artificial intelligence that you might have seen in movies, still in the early days, and nothing to worry about at this point in time. Thing is, regardless of what we've seen in fiction, I think a lot of people don't know just how much of what their phone can do is based on AI. I mean, sure, we've seen the typical Snapchat and Instagram filters, which depend on your phone being able to know that it's looking at a face, but that's actually just the tip of the iceberg. I can assure you that today already, the phone or device that you have is applying artificial intelligence to improve every experience that you can imagine. So let's say if you're a smartphone user, it is improving the way that the phone is able to receive audio. It's improving it the way it's able to, you know, do echo and noise cancellation on it. To be able to actually understand what you are saying and based on that, be able to do certain things. It is able to improve your photography experience by a huge, huge margin, what it used to be able to do. It's already doing it on the video next. It is improving that on what we call natural language processing. Think about, you know, being able to talk to a person anywhere in the world 
but that person is not able to speak your language. And the phone is able to basically, in real time, translate from your language into a different language, and the person on the other hand hears that different language, and you guys can have a conversation, for example. And probably the most interesting example of that is how I started this video. It's crazy to see that a flagship smartphone today lacks the massive sensor of my mirrorless camera that I'm using to film this video, and yet can compensate for those shortcomings through AI. And then to be able to see that evolution when you compare it to how AI was at its infancy with the previous flagship. Think of it this way, in the past, the sensors on a smartphone or on a security camera, they really used to be dumb. What that means is they would capture whatever light is coming into them, but they never knew what that light stood for, what it meant. With AI or with machine learning, we're giving those cameras, those microphones, the ability to be able to understand the data that they're capturing. So it knows, well, this is skin, or it might know this is fabric, and based on that, you can process it very differently. One great example is, I mean, if you just look at the capability that the cameras have today in terms of being able to capture images in low light conditions, you actually train that neural model to be able to take out a lot of the noise from the image, for example. But that's just one example. What we're able to do is we're able to get depth information. The processing that we have in a smartphone for camera, the, the amount of computational photography that we can do is so much more than what a typical standalone camera, even the SLR has, and that is why I have two DSLRs sitting at home, and now I've moved to basically just using my smartphone for at least the last two to three years. Now, I think it is important to make a distinction, and it's that the phone's processor is actually the most important piece of the puzzle. Surely, camera sensors and versions of Android have evolved in five years, but since smartphone processors are complete systems on a chip, both the image signal processor that takes the photos and the artificial intelligence that interprets them all live inside whatever chip your phone came with. The main reason why one of the selling points of a flagship is its photography is simply because they carry the most complete tools to process them. The Qualcomm Snapdragon A88 Plus is the company's latest flagship offering, which they dub as the beast for the most interesting reasons. Honestly, the capabilities on this product from every perspective, whether it's artificial intelligence or graphics or, you know, for example, on the camera, now we can actually capture 120, 120 12 megapixel images in one second. You know, in techie terms, it's 2.6 gigapixels per second of processing that this guy can do on the camera side alone. With the AI, we have, you know, enabled almost 26 trillion operations per second. To have that amount of AI processing capability in the palm of your hand is the reason why we call it a beast. And at the same time, we can do three times more processing in certain scenarios for the same amount of given power. Now, if you're talking about a device that fits into the palm of your hand, that last part that I mentioned is absolutely critical. And I think this segues perfectly into how artificial intelligence has addressed paradigms of the past. It used to be that the more powerful your chip, the more it chewed up your battery, but I'm sure you've noticed that that has changed recently. I mean, battery sizes on phones haven't really grown much in the past two to three years, and it's mainly due to how AI enables more efficient operations. Why do we need this much level of performance from an AI perspective? Now, these things that I talked about, right, like segmentation to be able to understand different parts of a frame, or to do HDR, or to do, you know, portrait modes, we used to do that on a, let's say, a single frame for still images. But now, if I need to do this processing for every frame in a video that you're capturing at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, well, you can envision now I need 60 times more processing. But the key is you must be able to do at a performance or at a power point where your device actually still lasts the whole day. And that's what we excel at. I think one of the coolest elements found in this new Snapdragon A88 Plus is the sensing hub. The fact that the AI allows your phone to be smart enough to be aware of its surroundings and adapt to them. For example, when your phone is just sitting, and what we're able to do with the sensing hub is bring in data from audio, from the microphone, from the video, from location, and be able to create this contextual picture of what the user is doing. So a great use case of that, for example, is that let's say your phone is sitting and it's uh, 2 a.m. and the phone is able to process that sound that, for example, it's a child crying. Well, that's something that you may want to alert a certain person that, hey, they should take some action on that. That sensing hub is able to see the ambient noise that you might be in 
And for example, just go and increase the volume that you might have your on, on your phone such that you'll be able to hear the ringtone, even though you might be in a very, very noisy environment, for example. With the artificial intelligence capability in it, running at extremely low power, by the way, this is much lower power level now, can sense that you're driving. Well, there are certain things that probably you should not be doing when you're driving. All of those things can come together with a sensing hub. So that's what we are building together in that sensing hub. And safety features aside, it's also a topic of convenience. To see applications like Spotify switch into a driving mode is actually an AI feature done through the chip. The idea of having my phone adapt to my environment to enhance features or protect me from bad behaviors is quite the thing during busy times. The thing is, privacy is also a major concern. To have a device be always on around us does raise a red flag. It begs the question of how this evolution of AI actually helps the consumer. The way this happens, or used to happen, if you remember in the past, for example, if you were just you know, uh, you know, uh, dictating a message on your device, the device would basically take that audio, send it out to somewhere on the cloud, the processing would happen on the cloud, and then the result would be sent back to the device. Well, with the AI capability that we are baking into our products, you don't need to do that. That content stays on the device, you're able to process it right on the device, and then be able to use it. It's actually an area that we are really focused on, which is on device learning. So I'll give you an example, when you use your keyboard, and especially if you're using Google Keyboard, it actually uses something called federated learning. So it's actually optimizing for the way you might use your keyboard or the words that you might use. So it's basically tweaking the model based on exactly what you do on your device. And then it might actually share a very, very synthesized version of that to the core model that sits somewhere in a server without exposing any of your private information. It's a very good example of how you will start to see some degree of on-device learning happening. It actually enhances many of those capabilities. It customizes those experiences to you, the user. And I think that's where we're going in the future. Which also points to more convenience in features since digital assistants in the past were only as good as your internet connection and obviously the limits of your data plan. This also opens up the door to what we can expect from AI in the future. If it can make our phones more aware and more efficient, all while being more private, having Siad obviously opened up more questions for what we can expect from AI in the future and not necessarily on smartphones. So right now, when you want to kind of immerse yourself into the world around you, you have to, of course, do it through things like virtual reality. But now what you can go into as time goes by is into augmented reality devices. Now this may take the form of, you know, some sort of glasses that you're wearing, but it can really make these experiences just completely seamless. But you can imagine, right, you need to be able to identify things that you are looking through and then to be able to augment on top of that. All of those are AI problems. At the same time, let's take the example of you playing a game in the future and you're playing that game using artificial uh, or rather augmented reality. So what you can do now is, you know, typically you hold a device and you're able to press certain buttons to play the game. No more. You can actually point at a character in the game. You can talk to the character using natural language processing because, well, that's a capability that we are doing. Based on how you're playing the game, the game can actually change the plot of the game, make it different, make it more interesting, or it can change the textures that you have in that game. All of those are examples of what we have coming up. And I always like to talk about, uh, you know, there is a notion or a, a concept of AI for good. So there was this engagement that we did some time ago with, uh, with a company in India, where you can actually take your smartphone camera, put a small adapter on top of it with a lens, and it can actually look inside the, uh, the eye of a person and be able to detect, for example, things like uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is a condition which deteriorates the eye. Now, this might be an environment where people don't have those capabilities or they don't have access to, uh, you know, healthcare very readily. Well, with something like this, you're able to help those people. Another good one that we are looking at with a partner right now, actually, is based on the way I'm speaking, we can actually detect your respiration and detect some respiratory conditions, for example, even like onset of COVID, for example. So there is so much that's still to be tapped, especially from a health perspective, uh, that I I'm just really excited about, uh, you know, we already have the enablement, we're just taking the next steps now to bring those use cases to the front.
To conclude, I have to admit that this has been one of my favorite interviews so far. I'll be linking to the full podcast episode in the description as we do dive deeper into a ton of topics we couldn't cover here, which only makes a point for how complicated artificial intelligence is, and yet how it is for the sake of simplifying what we do every day. I remember years ago when Google launched the Google Assistant and I felt that it was too bold a name. If a product is designed to assist you, well, it should do tasks for you, but it's clear that those capabilities have only become possible as the chips on our phones have become more powerful. That said, it's also interesting to note that even if chip makers provide so much capability, smartphone makers don't always take full advantage of it. As OEMs control their own versions of Android, the fact that one phone takes better photos than the other using the same chip is just one example of how software implementation matters. So does the processor on your phone matter? The quick answer is yes. I don't think you need to upgrade your phone every year, but there is a case for paying a bit more attention to what these new chips can do with every generation, and not just when it comes to benchmarks, as that's only part of the story. For how much a phone has become a tool in our daily lives, the more it can do, the more useful it'll be for you over a longer period of time. Let us know what you think about artificial intelligence, AI, this interview, and just my experience learning new things in the comments down below. Let us know what you think about this video format as well as I really enjoyed doing it. And also follow us on social media and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. You can follow me on my personal handles to see me, again, discover new things that my phone can do every day. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you saw. I'm Jaime Rivera. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.